All right, everyone. Welcome once again to the Manufacturing E-Commerce Success Series. I'm one of your co-hosts, Damon Pastalka. I can't even hardly talk, Kurt. I can't, I can't. And, and, and I got Kurt Anderson up here, up here beside me, but we're so excited. We honestly, we would have missed this easily, but I'm so excited for our guest today. I really can't even talk anymore. <laughs> Kurt, Take it away. I might just walk right off the stage here. Dave. I like, <laughs> I have you. no poker face, guys. I can't even pretend that I'm not completely starstruck. We have a patriot. We have tr truly an idol. Uh, I know he's a very humble yeah. man, but Dr. Yehuro Williams is with us today. Dr. Williams, how are you, my friend? I am fantastic, and it's great to be with you, Kurt and Damon. Been looking yeah. forward to this for a couple of weeks now, so I'm very excited to be here today. I, Damon, when we started this little thing, if you told me that today, you know, that like I'm, I mean, I am speechless. So, Doctor <laughs> your hero, I'm going to just give a quick intro because I'm going to talk as little as possible today because we want you to really take the ball here. So, distinguished university chair and professor of history at University of Saint Thomas, you're the founding director of racial just the racial justice uh, initiative. You are a notable scholar of the civil rights. You have your PhD from Howard University. You have a wonderful TED talk. You've written multiple books. We're going to talk about your book on Jackie Robinson today. You were the historian at the Jackie Robinson Foundation, which we're, again, we're going to talk about. And of course, being Damon and I are huge history buffs, particularly business history buffs and manufacturing is our stick here today. We're going to talk about, you have done an amazing, incredible job as a commentator and contributor on the machines that built America, the food that built America, the Titans that built America, the toys that built America, all sorts of other incredible shows. Oh, guys, if you haven't seen it, <laughs> yeah, have to check out all these shows. I'm probably leaving out a thousand other things. So my question for you today is number one, dude, do you ever sleep or what? Like how do you, <laughs> how are you, and, and, Guys, and if, first off, please connect with Dr. Williams. Yeah, and I, he is truly a hero. He is a champion and leading the charge on civil rights. Uh, you're doing an incredible job. So, Dr. Mm -hmm. Williams, with that, please share a little bit about your background. What led you in this direction? You are a champion of civil rights. What led you to your PhD? Let's talk about a little bit young Dr. Williams, if we will. You know, I grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, a community that deindustrialized uh, in the 19, late 60s and 70s, like many communities nationally. And so there wasn't a lot of opportunity there. Uh, in fact, uh, I watched some of the big industries that had been kind of the foundation of that community leave from Remington Arms and, and others, and just kind of the exodus that left um, this shattered community in its wake. And so I grew up, um, my father was a musician or is a musician. My mother was a teacher. And I grew up um, spending most of my uh, summers with my father at, in the largest public housing complex in the city where they had this cultural arts center. Mm -hmm. And so from an early, early on, I was exposed to kind of African history, um, native indigenous people's history. But I was also learning that in the context of the stark um, contrast between this deindustrialized shell, which was Bridgeport, Connecticut, and then the very affluent suburbs that surrounded Bridgeport and all the wealth that was there and trying to understand and make sense of that. So I decided, um, you know, I, I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be like Thurgood Marshall, who was my hero. Yep. Went off to University of Scranton, uh, went to a pre-law meeting and saw you know, 100 kids sitting in the pre-law meeting. And I said, yeah, not for me. <laughs> so I always loved history. And I kind of had nurtured that and developed that early on. And I said, I'd, I'd like to kind of pursue that. And that led to me uh, pursuing the PhD at Howard and informs my work today. Still trying to come to grips with what it means to, um, to build something in the absence of, of nothing or in the absence of what is what many people perceive as waste. The interesting thing about the uh, Art Center is that um, the P.T. Barnum Apartments actually sat right next to the solid waste treatment plant in the city of Bridgeport. So this oasis of culture sat in the middle of a dump. And yet so many beautiful things were produced in that space. And it, I think, speaks to what we can do when we don't we see opportunity rather than, um, you know, the, the reality that other people see. Just have to adjust our, our filter a little bit. Jackie, Rob, uh, excuse me. Um, I was going to say Jackie Robinson. I know we're going to talk about him um, later. But um, uh, uh, in 1963, 1964, um, one of the people that articulates this very beautifully says, the world changes according to the way people see it. And if you can alter even by a millimeter the way people look at reality, then you can change it. That's James Baldwin. Right. And when Baldwin says that, it's all about altering the way that we're looking at reality. That's true um, in 
business and manufacturing. It's certainly true in other facets of, of our walk. Well, you know, that's perfect. And if you don't mind, let's yeah. go there right now. Let's go right to Jackie Robinson. And guys, happy Friday to everybody. If you're with us, please drop a hello. Let us know you're there or where you're coming from. Please give a big warm welcome to Dr. Yuhuru Williams here today. Connect with Dr. Williams on LinkedIn. You want to follow what he has going on. We've got Gary. We've got Dan Bigger. Our big Ronald. Uh, Ronald's here, of yeah, course. Everybody out of, out of D.C. So, guys, thanks cool. for being here today. Snia's here. Greg Mishu is here. So, guys, thank you. We truly have a, a patriot and a hero here. So talking about patriot and hero, let's go, let's go right there. Baseball season last Friday, April 15th was Jackie Robinson day in major league baseball, 75th anniversary, 75th anniversary uh, already. We were just talking before, if you guys go to ESPN, they are posting articles from sport magazine at that time in 1947, 1952, really a fascinating read. So, Dr. Williams, you were a historian from, and I'll and share a little bit. I think maybe you even took a break from your career. You, when I say break, a break from academia to be the historian of the Jackie Robinson Foundation. And you have a book coming out in September. I put the book in the chat box. Call me Jack, right? Call, call him Jack. The story of Jackie Robinson, the black freedom fighter. Let's go there. Let's talk about Jackie Robinson and what you, man, you had to under, you had yeah. the inside scoop. It so was cool. you know, probably, Kurt, one of the best decisions I ever made. I was uh, kind of mid-career, yep. and I met the president of the foundation at the Congressional Black Caucus in D.C., and she said, you should come out and check us out. I think it'd be great if you just kind of came down. And, you know, um, a lot of things that you were talking about resonate with us because that's our core mission. I'd always been a fan of Jackie Robinson, I think, like most people. Um, but I'd only known Jackie on the field to play. I didn't really get to, to know much about his personal life or what he did post-baseball. And when I went to the foundation and spent some time there um, and kind of acquainted myself better with Jack, I kind of fell in love with him as a person. Yeah. And this was an incredible individual. In fact, I was you know, so anxious to quote Jack that I was muddling up James Baldwin, who talked about the, the world, the way world changes yeah. Yeah. by how people see it. Jack said that a life is not important except in the impact that it has on other lives. So in that moment, when I was thinking wow. about whether I should stay and just kind of stay the course in terms of my academic career, if I should take this sabbatical and spend some time at the foundation and work with them, it just seemed to me that that was the appropriate choice because I could reach many more people. I'm using Jack and his legacy and his philosophy to really help empower young people to think differently about their opportunities. And the great thing about Jack as a, as a, a human being is it's easy for people to get focused on what he does in terms of athletics. You know, um, the four sports city plays at UCLA, you know, he's an accomplished football player, a golfer. Um, certainly everybody knows about the 10 seasons in professional baseball and, and the World Series and everything else. But Jack was also um, an organic intellectual and an incredible business person. And people kind of lose sight of the fact that Jack um, post baseball spends much of that time supporting the civil rights movement, becomes a great uh, confidant of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, becomes someone who challenges Malcolm X and then develops a personal relationship with Malcolm X as a result of the two of them butting heads on key issues in the city of Harlem. 1964, Jack will found or co-found uh, Freedom National Bank to help provide um, low interest loans to African-Americans to help them start businesses. Um, and he'll become one of the first black business executives in America for a large chain chock full of nuts. Um, right after he leaves baseball, 1956-57, he'll become head of HR for for that company. So there's, this is a, you know, part of what we wanted to do in the book is kind of disentangle the Jackie mythology from Jack, the human being and, and focus on this man who did incredible things and who can be an inspiration to us all. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, all right. First off, happy Friday. We have my yep. man. We've got, we Don got lots of Alaska people here. Got... We have my, my dear friend, yeah, Devin. today. Gene God. from Bemis Point. We have Shannon from LA. We have John in Jersey, Gail in Canada. So guys, if you're just joining us here again, please connect with Dr. Williams. We, this is yeah. such an honor and privilege for him, you know, give a warm welcome, drop him a note on, on LinkedIn. Let's uh, be huge baseball fans. Let's go. Let's just, let's take a deep plunge there. Jay, Damon and I are huge baseball fans. Let's think about what Jackie went through. So Dr. Williams, can you like, you know, enlighten us, just share, like it is really unfathomable for us to think about, the, the yeah. pain, the enduring, the, the, you know, St. Louis, he couldn't stay with the uh, same hotel as the team. You know, just let's go there and like really put ourselves in like, what did Jackie go through in 1947? 
Well, when we think about Jack as being the first African-American in the modern era to um, integrate baseball, um, he faced those challenges alone, essentially. And it, it didn't matter what kind of supports that Branch Rickey and the Dodger organization were willing to supply for him. Right. He faced opposition among his own teammates. He faced opposition mm -hmm. from opposing teams. He faced opposition from fans, those who were from uh, Brooklyn and those who were beyond Brooklyn. Right. In fact, you know, uh, you know, he was as happiest, I think, um, when he played in Montreal and he was getting yeah. ready yeah. for the season because the Canadians opened right. him uh, or welcomed him with open arms. Right. But here in the States, it was very difficult because he encountered so much um, prejudice. And right. I can't imagine. I think this is one of the things that we think about when we think about Jack um, right. is, is the human being. A lot of times his wife was accompanying him. So he's right. not only concerned about his own safety, he has to be concerned about the safety of his family. Um, this is an age when, you know, today we think about all the protections that ath um, athletes have. That's a different era. Different. And so every time that Jack yeah. took the field to play, there was the potential for um, things not to go according to plan. And then he's also operating in a world where segregation is the norm. So often, even before the game, we think about the pressure that athletes face today. Even before Jackie takes the field, um, he's got to deal with being denied access to uh, places of public accommodation, not being able to eat with the team. In some cases, even being told um, opposing organizations saying they're not going to uh, take the field if Jackie Robinson is going to play. Yeah. So it's all those things that kind of compound his experience. And yet, in spite of all that, you know, um, we focus on that first year where he and Branch Rickey make this bargain and Jack agrees not to fight back. I love what ESPN is doing and sharing some of that later, um, those later newspaper articles, because Jack after that was uh, very assertive and fought back all the time. In fact, yeah, the sports yeah. writers, you know, took great pleasure in talking yeah. about the uppity Jackie Robinson because he was always kind of pushing the boundaries, yep. challenging inequality in that space. Right. I absolutely love that. Yeah. And again, guys, if you get a chance, go to ESPN, check these articles. They're fantastic. And, you know, in the relationship that he had with his wife, the, uh, his wife has mentioned multiple times in those articles at that time, you know, and it was really fascinating to uh, see how these journalists were documenting what was going on at that time. And let's, let's spin. And I know we're here for manufacturing e-commerce success. And we're going to talk about Jackie, the entrepreneur and how he was a huge advocate for manufacturing, which I didn't yeah. know until you and I spoke, Dr. Williams. But let's talk a little bit. Let's 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 spin it a little bit on a positive. I think like Pee Wee Reese, there were some, you know, any of our diehard baseball fans know some of the great players from that Brooklyn team. There were a lot of advocates that really embraced uh, Jackie, that were uh, uh, champions for Jackie, and really helped turn the tables to get past this real ugly time in our, in our history. Share like some of the positive things that Jackie experienced, uh, if you could. I think they're numerous. And, and you mentioned his relationship with Pee, Pee Wee Reese, certainly his right. relationship with Ralph Branca. He certainly right. had people on the team who came around right. um, and, and ultimately became great allies, if not friends um, right. and confidants, because it wasn't it, it's not like, you know, to be fair to his teammates, they could even even understand the extent right. to which yeah. Jack right. was dealing with this kind of whole next level of stress right. and pressure related right. to. On that work, and yet at the same time, they were very affirmative of him. And when Jack, uh, when they win the World Series, and Jack talks about his teammates, and he talks about being accepted on on the Brooklyn Dodgers, and he's beloved in the city of Brooklyn. That's the other part of this: is that there are parts of that story that kind of get lost again in looking at this solely as the Jackie Robinson story, instead of the story of America at the crossroads. So we've had numerous uh, moments like that in our history, which can be celebratory because they teach us something about the value of diversity. The one I've been talking about a lot this year is the Challenger. If you look at the crew of the Challenger um, space shuttle mission in 1986, it's a portrait of multicultural America. Mm -hmm. First Asian American, Japanese American, and Ellison Onizuka, who's on that mission. Ronald McNair, descendant of, of sharecroppers and slaves, African American on that mission. Judith Resnick, uh, Jewish American woman, fourth mm -hmm. woman. Krista McAuliffe, the teacher in space. Yep. Yep. Uh, three white men, how most people would have identified them, but two of them having significant immigrant um, uh, backgrounds. Right. This was a portrait of American triumph. When the challenger goes down, everyone focuses on that as a moment of setback and a failure. But I always like to remind people, uh, it's important to also note that even in the midst of those types of tragedies, and Ronald Reagan spoke to this that evening when he spoke to the American people, he called the challenger crew pioneers. Um, he said they were pushing us forward. We have to recognize that in the moment of failure, there's always an opportunity for reinvention, like the phoenix rising from the ashes. 
It's what Alexander Hamilton was trying to convince the American people of, certainly the House of Representatives in the report on manufacturing in opposing Jefferson when he says, look, uh, I get the idea of a, a republic of yeoman small farmers, but ultimately empowering people to fail and fail big is what's going to drive us forward and make us great. And it, it certainly has. Man. Oh my God. Wow. American. Where's John Baglino? Drop the mic. <laughs> that was like multiple drop the mic moments. Yeah. A moment of silence there. Dr. Williams, we just needed. Yeah. American. American triumph. I, I love American triumph. And guys, think about that tragedy, failure, what it did. And I, and I want to share this, you know, what Jackie did, look, you know, um, in the, one of the articles, it talks about when Jackie was going to other cities, it brought out the African-Americans and they were cheering ecstatically yeah. for that. You know, and we saw this, whether it was like Joe DiMaggio brought out the Italian-Americans. Yeah. Uh, you know, my wife and I uh, go to baseball stadiums around the country. Ichiru, you know, you'd see yep. large Japanese crowds, yep. you know, any, uh, you know, if you have that nationalistic uh, uh, favor and support. And so it was just wonderful. I, I was trying to look at some of the positive sides and like, Hey, it brought African-Americans into baseball and look, it led the charge for Bob Gibson. I grew up a huge Reggie yeah. Jackson fan, yeah. Ricky Henderson, all the great hall of famers that we have. And when you really look at Jackie as a baseball player, you know, what a gift he was yeah. that he did for the sport and what he did for our country, you know? So yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, this is so good. So yeah. let's go here. Let's let's slide into manufacturing entrepreneurship. And then Gary uh, Gary Wood said, "I've seen Dr. Williams on the History Channel many yeah. times." And guys, stick with us because we're gonna go there in like two minutes. Jackie Robinson, as you just said, he was a huge uh, uh, you know fan of entrepreneurship, entrepreneur himself, and a big advocate for manufacturing. Please share uh, a little bit on that. What you discovered there in your studies. You know, Jack uh, was unable to finish uh, his final year at UCLA. And mm -hmm. so he ends up, you know, leaving. Rachel actually um, is very accomplished and she'll, you know, get a degree in psychiatric nursing and, and do a number of things in that field, including um, at one point uh, working at Yale University Hospital. Mm -hmm. So you kind of see the academics there. But Jack was a proponent of business. And so the interesting thing is that in his post-baseball life, you see him do a number of things which are very important in understanding um, the importance of kind of elevating and thinking about diversity in business. Chock Full of Nuts um, in 1956, 1957 was kind of a New York-based uh, coffee chain. And they also had a number of, you know, lunch counters in the city, a predominantly minority workforce. And the owner of Chock Full of Nuts invites Jack to be his head of HR. And so Jack's first post-baseball experience will be in corporate America at mm -hmm. Chock Full of Nuts, where he'll be a champion of diversity. But he also recognizes there are real barriers to African-Americans. And so he spends a lot of his time thinking about what will break down those barriers. He recognizes access to capital is key. If African-Americans are going to be involved in, in businesses, if they're going to start businesses, if they can, are going to be entrepreneurs, they're going to need access to capital. And he also understands that housing is a challenge and education mm -hmm. is a challenge paying tuition, uh, being able to you know, set a foundation that will allow young people to thrive is all kind of mixed into to, to that, um, the des desire to achieve the American dream in that regard. And so what you'll see Jack do in, in 1964 is he'll team up uh, with a uh, lawyer and they will co-found Freedom National Bank in Harlem precisely for the purpose mm -hmm. of trying to stimulate the growth of Black and Puerto Rican businesses in Harlem and also to facilitate home ownership. Uh, for people of color in Harlem and beyond. And you'll see him expand that mission. So in, uh, in 1970, shortly before his death, uh, 6970, he'll also start a construction company. And the purpose of that company was to build low income housing for, again, Black and Latino people uh, living in New York who didn't have access to the same. So you see Jack really seeing industry manufacturing as keys to empowerment and recognizing that as tools, these really could empower the next generation. It's one of the things that I love about him, the complexity of him, not simply as a sports hero, but somebody who doesn't get credit in terms of what he does in terms of innovation and business. Man, wow. this is so good. And that's in, you know, and you shared on our conversation the other day on how he was an advocate for encouraging African Americans to not only get an entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, but more specifically manufacturing and how critical manufacturing is. Boy, we have a lot of great comments here. Oh, our man. friend Greg Mishu in Madison, Wisconsin, likes to ask, could we hear more about Hamilton and manufacturing? Sure. You know, Alexander Hamilton, you, there, there's that tension that exists uh, in the founding between 
Jefferson's vision of what America could be and Hamilton's vision of what America could be. And Hamilton is convinced that manufacturing is key. He recognizes that this is going to be a hard sell because he's speaking to a nation which is more comfortable with and has actually been kept in a position of an agrarian society by virtue of British colonial policies. The mm-hmm. British didn't want to see manufacturing developing yep. in the United States. In yep. fact, we all learned this in you know grammar school, the triangle trade. You you wanted to you know take cheap uh, raw materials from the colonies, mass produce them in England, and then send them back to the colonies, and, and you're you know, cre- creating capital in that wheel. Hamilton recognizes early on that American, uh, if if it's going to be successful, if it's going to be on the par with um, its European sister states, it is going to have to invest in manufacturing. It's going to have to incentivize incentivize manufacturing. And it's going to have to help people overcome the fear of failure. And he actually talks about that in the report of manufacturing, that that's what's key is that, you know, the the biggest challenge, uh, maybe FDR said it best, but I think Hamilton was channeling it in other languages. There's nothing to fear but fear itself, and we really can't afford not to take the plunge in terms of focusing on this as the tool, which ultimately will help us build an empire to rival the greatest empires in in Europe. (laughs) What do you say? Okay. What do you say? This is this is so incredible. I'm just so honored to have you here and sharing this with you. I mean, I'm having a hard time keeping my composure. That's that's all I can say. We have Chris Harrington here saying hello, Dr. Williams. We have Brian out here. We have Gail. We have John Bigger. Again, Nicole, my my sweetheart. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, lots of great people here dropping comments. Guys, guys, keep the comments coming for Dr. Williams here. So guys, would I absolutely, you know, let's slide baseball into history and into manufacturing, Dr. Williams. Yeah. So what I absolutely love, look what Jackie did in baseball. He proved, look how much better baseball is when we yeah. bring in our different walks of life. We bring in Hispanic. We bring in African-American. We bring in... Korean, Japanese, whatever. Damon, do we love baseball or what? It's a better sport when <laughs> yeah. we just take advantage of all the talent that we have in our country. Basketball, football, baseball, what have you. Now, am I foolish to say, geez, is it only sports or could this happen in entrepreneurship or in the rest of the world, academia, other yes. walks of life? Yes. Absolutely. So let's slide into manufacturing. And so you are a superstar on the History Channel. You actually, do. you have your own show, I think. Sound Smart? Is are you host of the Sound it was Smart? A web show that History did a couple of years ago, and I was the host for that. Um, okay. And love, love doing that. Uh, like awesome. history in a minute, really fun kind of bite-sized history nuggets. Awesome. Nice. So let's. All right, guys. For all of our history fans out there, man, I've been watching you for years. And guys, this is what I did. I said my wife and I, you know, we're stuck. You know, my my she enjoys it, so I want to say she was stuck. But we're watching all these the titans that built America, the food that built America, the machines that built. I'm like, hey, here's a new one. She's like, hey, let's watch it. And Dr. Yuhuru Williams is on over and over and over. So what do I do, guys? This is the power of LinkedIn. I pull up LinkedIn, and you know who we have speaking three weeks from now? We have Kayleen McCabe. Am I saying her last name correctly? One of your fellow cohorts on yeah. the food that built America. So guys, come back to us in three weeks. It's pretty it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But Dr. Williams, what you did is just, you know, let's go there. So last night I'm watching Gumslingers on Food That Built America, and it was Wrigley, and it was uh, the gentleman that actually founded Gum, and the very first person that pops up is Mr. Handsome Dr. Williams. So just share a little bit about the History uh, Channel, this whole series, and what it meant to you, and let's hear about that underneath the hood. What I, you know, history came probably about four years ago now, four or five years ago, and they said, we're doing this new series. Uh, it's called The Food That Built America. We think you'd be great. And we're just going to um, unpack some of these famous brands and ask questions about how they became such iconic brands. And I think the first episode I was in, or the first one they asked me to participate in was on Heinz Ketchup, yeah. uh, Coca-Cola, and yep. Hershey. Wow. And, you know, I'm a huge fan of, of um, you know, all of those brands. In yeah. fact, my, my waistline um, has suffered. <laughs> uh, because of that. So, you know, I was, I was all in and you know, what it was, what was great about the series is what they really, I had written a book called um, teaching us history beyond the textbook. And in that mm-hmm. book, I talked about this concept of haunted history, the idea that wouldn't it be great to excite young people about history by talking about street names or um, buildings that are named after people that they no longer remember. Like I lived yeah. in Connecticut and there's the Samuel Jaskilka highway. So why is, he haunting the young people because right. we forgot who he was. And, yeah. and it's kind of calling young people to kind of revisit that. And I think they liked that concept. So they were like, we're kind of thinking about that, you know, think about that on a larger scale. 
we use these products every day. We never ask the question about how did they become the iconic product products that they became and what's the you know kind of interesting backstories there. One of the um, stories that I talk about uh, in or one of the the scenarios I would always use in in teacher professional development was around Pepsi Cola. And the interesting thing about Pepsi Cola is that, you know, it's goes through this really incredible corporate history where the first iteration it goes bankrupt um, because of overpriced sugar inventory during the First World War. The owner tries to sell it, including trying to sell it to Coke. They don't offer a bid. And so this is a, a brand that's spiraling until the Great Depression when they decide to double the amount of product for the same price as you were going to uh, get for other soft drinks. And they were the first uh, brand to adopt jingle advertising. They um, advertised on radio. The song was called Nickel Nickel. The song becomes a hit. It literally is, you know, um, uh, translated into, I think, 43 different languages. Um, and Pepsi remains a corporate giant to this day, largely because they were willing in that moment to look at this new medium of radio and jingle advertising and say, yeah, we'll do that. And when I think about that, for all of the folks who are on the call who are of a certain age, um, I won't out all of us, but we know what this is like. Where's the beef? We immediately know what that comes from. That's the Wendy's campaign that that sits with all of us. Right. Um, I think about the Seinfeld episode with George Costanza, Costanza, and we laugh about that. But there's something to be said for Pepsi in that moment, recognizing right. that that um, disruptive innovation could spell huge profits for it as it was trying to define itself and distinguish itself from its competitors. Just a great story. And that's what the whole series kind of pivots on that. How do we understand these iconic brands? What can we learn from those encounters? Um, and, and it's been great being a part of it. Well, what an wow. honor. Well, yeah. yeah, guys, anybody just joined us, Dr. Williams here with us. Please connect with him. Guys, give a huge shout out. Give a warm welcome. Connect with him on LinkedIn. He has a new book coming out in September. You want to grab it. It's a phenomenal book. All sorts of books. He has a great TED Talk. I'll just Google his name and there's like, a, I, I've seen so many videos on you. So, okay, let's take and let's take that another step further. So a great thing when you watch the, uh, and a number of us are huge History Channel fans. Yeah. We've been watching the show. You know, you keep hearing about the digital transformation of today and what COVID's done and our pre-cheers for manufacturers and making that e-commerce shift, okay? And boy, I don't care what part, you know, if you're in the 1800s when, you know, when you did Titans that built America, whether it was Roosevelt or, you know, whoever, uh, you know, in the more, uh, JP Morgan, those early days, but the people were disrupting the market always. Henry Ford disrupted the market. No more horses, right? Uh, Wrigley, I watched Wrigley last night, and you know, he didn't invent gum. What he did, and the analogy I gave before we jumped online, he was like the Gary V of advertising yeah. in like the early 1900s. He quadrupled his budget, and that's how he beat the founder of gum. And so as you're saying, uh, Dr. Williams, you know, let's talk about like what what were some of the shocking things that you found then that would be applicable for our manufacturers today as far as that disruption goes? Uh, I think, it again, it goes back to what we were talking about in terms of Hamilton. But I also think it speaks powerfully to some of the people who were um, uh, featured on the Titans that built America, mm -hmm. specifically the, the two that I love, Henry Ford, who's problematic in all kinds of ways. But when yeah. you think about. Um, you know, his lack of fear and kind of pushing for that vision, um, the way that he thought about manufacturing in ways that ultimately helped him to produce a cheaper automobile. And then at the end of that story, the failure of Ford to recognize that he needed to keep up with his competitors is in a nutshell, the story of business. It is, you know, this idea of be the disruptor, but you have to continue to yeah. be the disruptor in order to maintain the success that you enjoy in the very beginning. And it's the folks who don't recognize that who become complacent or fearful, um, or who don't recognize the dangers lurking in that next innovation and how it might impact them that ultimately uh, don't succeed. I think that's the, you know, the story of all of these, these, these um, uh, iconic companies, certainly with breakfast cereals, like here yeah. are the Kellogg brothers, you know, yeah. Yeah. Dr. Kellogg does not in any way want to commercialize this product, which he thinks is for health. Mm -hmm. His brother recognizes immediately that this could be a huge sell. Somebody else comes in and, and sees that and they run with the idea. Post the drugs are yeah. left, you know, um, now competing for something that they would have had yeah. uh, you know, priority on that. Bird's eye, certainly the same case. Right. Mm -hmm. Pond, certainly right. the same case. And I think that's the interesting part about this because I think it speaks volumes about the moment that we're in now when we're talking about digital transformation. Yeah. 
COVID-19, you know, there are terrible things that we will always associate with the last two years and what we've been through um, globally. But the reality is it presents many opportunities for us to rethink the customer experience, um, integration of services, how people work and communicate. These are all tremendous opportunities. And I think it's those entrepreneurs, those manufacturers, those business leaders who are thinking in the way that Baldwin talked about differently about this moment, who ultimately will be able to see what others see as a challenge, as an opportunity. And that's really been you know, the, the, the jewel of those who have succeeded in that space. You've got Gail Robertson on today. Um, she has the best title ever. I just became friends with her on LinkedIn, but I, yeah. I have to <laughs> Uh, she she's chief curiosity officer, and I yeah. think that curiosity and innovation go hand in hand. And it's yes, they do. That ultimately, you know, being a disruptor begins with asking questions like, "Why do we? Why do you, just because we've always done it like this doesn't mean that we have to continue to do it like this? What if we do paint cars a different color? Right. Uh, what yeah. if we, you know, why? How are we pushing <laughs> the boundaries and trying to be better? You know, th those are the, you know, and and for me. A uh, gentleman, this because I'm a I'm a '70s kid, born in '71, '80s kid. I think the song that does it for me more than any other, um, "Video Killed the Radio Star." Video, yep. Killed. First video ever broadcast on MTV. Um, I remember that video like it was yesterday because you know only a handful of kids in the neighborhood had MTV and had cable television, yep. which was this innovation. We were still turning on the TV with the pliers at that point. Yeah, yeah. But I love the lyrics in that. I heard you on the wireless back in '52. Um, if I was young, it didn't stop you coming through. This whole thing that they capture in the song about the spirit of innovation and radio doesn't keep up. And by the early 1980s, videos are king. Well, I remember my grandfather's, you know, driving around in my grandfather's car with the eight track tapes. Then mm -hmm. there were wonderful things called cassettes. We all remember this in short. You know, your your early dating life was sending uh, your person of choice a cassette, you know, listen to mix the mixtape order, the mixtape, right, literally. And then suddenly, halfway through the decade, that became CDs, and I could yeah. fit more. I still have one leg. My right leg is still slightly more developed than my left from carrying that heavy Walkman, but it was so <laughs> great to be able to you know, carry my tunes around with me. A yeah. sign of, of, of how well-adjusted and, and, and how um, you know, uh, prosperous you were at one point was to walk into someone's home and see the videos prominently displayed on their wall, the movie yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We don't do any of that anymore because the technologies yeah. move so fast, but the disruptors, the curious, were always asking the question that the Bengals are asking in that, that song, which is, you know, video kills the radio star because radio doesn't recognize that innovation is key yeah. to success. Yeah, it's so key. It's so key because it, it, just because you get to the top, that's just like, that's like, oh, I got to first base. I, I got to keep running because I'm not scoring unless I just run my heart out. And, and that's what I think a lot of companies get, get complacent. And when you look at companies, there's some, you know, obviously you talked about Coca-Cola, their brand is so big and things like that. But the vast majority of companies, that's just a starting point when you really hit your stride. Then you got to then you got to somehow get your your team, everyone else to really what's our next level of innovation. And they're all sitting there going, we just we just caught our breath from the last one. Right. But the, the leader's job anymore, and because you talk about the, the speed at which technology evolves now is almost, I mean, you know this better than, than I, obviously, but it, it changes so fast now, even from 10 years ago, mm -hmm. that if you're not in that constant process of daily thinking about that, I just don't know how you stay abreast of anything anymore because there's people catching you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of where you put that, Damon, because for me, um, I, I just love the way that you frame that. I, I try to tell that story in a humorous way for, for my students, but I, I hope that they're also picking up on the acceleration point now is so much great. It's like John Kennedy, um, it, the moon speech at, at Rice University, where he's talking about the speed of technology and how quickly it moved from one period to the next. We're witnessing that probably six times the speed that, that Kennedy was talking about in that moment. And to become complacent, to assume, as I did at one point, I thought, you know, I still have a closet full of CDs, uh, which, I, you know, but now everything is on my phone. I could take my yeah. entire library with me on this yeah. mini computer that I carry around on my hip, which when Gene Roddenberry is, is writing Star Trek is still kind of fantasy. And that's our reality today. Um, it's not fear of that in the way that you put it. In fact, um, uh, 
Pat Bigley of the Salt Lake News did a great cartoon on Muhammad Ali that I love and talking about business and also talking about activism. That's just appropriate. He said, Ali was the greatest, not because he was the champ. Ali was the greatest because he was always the challenger. Yeah. Innovators challenge. They yeah. change the game. They Keep never going. say they score the run and then they say, let's break the pieces up and build an entirely different uh, or look at this, this, this field differently so that we can continue to innovate and be in those spaces where, you know, um, we're continuing to create and, and create value in the process. Man, and tons of great comments here. We've got Mike oh my. and Dan and John Big. And Mike, yeah, he's talking about the A-Track. Yeah, John's going. John, this is this is uh, soon Netflix. I mean, this well, is one. That's a great. I mean, they kill Blockbuster. Then they then they move over, you know, and and now they're having trouble. Right. Think and think, you know, we could go on, you know, think about oh, yeah. Kodak and like some of these yeah. other, you know, major uh, brands that just kind of lost their way, you know, and, and uh, Innovators Challenge. And, and I think it's called like the Founder's Dilemma. Right. And, you know, uh, what direction do I go? How do I take it to that next level? And Steve Jobs, you know, when they had the iPod, right, the iPod for those, like that's even yep. dated, right. Yeah. The iPod. He knew that iTunes was going to kill and cannibalize the iPod. So, you know, where a company like Kodak didn't have the ability, Blockbuster Video didn't have the ability to cannibalize themselves. But again, guys, man, catch the History Channel, go to Food That Built America, Machines That Built America, watch all those and think about it for your business, your manufacturing operation and how you can apply it. And we'll wrap up on the uh, on, on your series on this one. Your hometown is, a, is Subway. And this <laughs> is absolutely fa fascinating. When Fred DeLuca founded Subway at 17 years old with a partner, they were they, they were doing miserable. They had days where they had like seven dollars in sales. If you remember this, Doctor Williams. Mm -hmm. But what did they? If you were doing seven dollars a day in sales, uh, Damon, what would you do? You open up a second location. Yeah. You yeah. open up a second location because they wanted to do A B testing. So this is in the '60s. Now, as marketers, what are we always talking about? As you know, our, our digital marketers. Hey, we need to do A B testing. Well, guess what? Subway was doing it. Uh, however many years With ago stores. that was. And, you know, built the largest, you know, franchise chain, you know, right in your backyard, Dr. Wood. Anything that you want to comment on Subway there? Just that I would have quit. I, I mean, I that's what, yeah. I'm <laughs> no, no. No. This is something, though, that's, that's true. Right. A lot of these innovators are half crazy. You have to be because to do what they did, if you, you listen to the stories, the shows that you help, the stories are so incredible because they see a vision that none of us can see. And and when it comes out in the end, it's it's brilliant. Steve Jobs, same way. He's just he's just one in, in our area. Everybody thought, and you know, I don't know if he envisioned this, but when he saw the iPod, then he saw the the phone, then he saw now they don't even care about iTunes anymore. I mean, they don't even care. He's, I don't even know if you can do it anymore. But uh, you know, it's just crazy. It's crazy. All right, so I know we have a ton of yeah. Like I haven't even been paying attention to time. It's like the I first know. time ever. I'm not even paying attention to time. And usually, like we're, all right. Dr. Williams, you are a uh, professor at the University of St. Thomas, a distinguished uh, scholar on civil rights, yeah. and you, uh, you know, you're right in the trenches dealing with young people on a daily basis. So for those of us, you know, a lot of us are parents out there, but, you know, maybe we're not uh, dealing with uh, college kids, college age kids as much as you are. Sure. What are some of the exciting things that you're seeing that you're hearing with young people at your university and conversations that you're having? It's a it's a great question, Kurt, because I think it's more um, and I never thought that I would be in this space. Um, you're, you're old enough now to be where your parents were when you're looking at the younger generation and asking yourself, what are they thinking? And why do they behave in that way? What's happening? But what I see is a lot of comfort with discomfort. That's really important. Yeah. They've lived wow. through, you know, I, I think about, um, you know, the Tom Brokaw is the greatest generation yeah, and yeah. kind of thinking about the generation that survived the second war, uh, survived the Great Depression and fought mm -hmm. the Second World War and why he's branding them as the greatest generation. That included athletes like, you know, Joe Lewis and Jackie Robinson. And they kind of all are symbols of that age, Jesse yeah. Owen, so on and so forth. This generation is different. I think their symbols are different. We saw that over the Olympics over the summer. I'm mean, dealing with issues of depression and what and being able to walk yeah. away from the game and seeing that as a strength and mm. prioritizing mental health and thinking differently about community and how mm. communities respond to trauma. Um, it's funny because you'll you'll see people sometimes say, well, that it seems like we're we're getting soft. I actually don't think that's the case at all. They're looking at things differently in a way 
that offers a tremendous opportunity for those who are willing to kind of iterate with them and think through the way that this moment has fundamentally altered who we are and what we will be in the years to come. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I've learned a lot from them. I think neurodiversity, for example, we talk a lot about diversity in traditional sense, but um, thinking about building a team that brings on people who think differently, mm -hmm. who have challenges that allow them to see opportunity where those of us who might be um, abled in some other sense can't see that and where we might all be going ultimately because uh, the environment, uh, COVID, are, are taking away those abilities in ways that we never thought we would have been challenged. So mm -hmm. Netflix, for example, we were talking about earlier, took great advantage of, of the moment that was COVID-19. We were all kind of trapped at home. Mm -hmm. um, but there were people who were thinking about, well, what about when we go back to work? You know, yeah. how do we engage? And it, it, we don't have the luxury of, of looking at this on our flat screen where, where we can do that. Um, it's kind of an interesting moment in that sense. So I'm learning three things from them. Uh, redefining what I thought resilience meant, because for me, resilience was always about stick to and, and, you know, toughing it out. And I think for them, it begins with live to fight another day, privilege your mental health in ways that actually build strength and capacity. Mm -hmm. You don't burn out when you are wise enough to take a step back and to recognize that, you know, to be in the game long-term is probably more valuable than to, you know, fantastically flame out over something. And a lot of the innovators that we cover on um, Food That Built America, I think about the Coke story, for example, um, you know, a, a lot of those folks kind of burn themselves out and it's left to somebody else to continue that work. And I think this generation privileges resilience in a different way. Um, certainly, uh, and, and I would, you know, I, I kind of see this as dystopian, but they don't. Um, an ability to exist and, and to build community in a virtual space, which is yeah. foreign yeah. to mm -hmm. me. So. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, I would have loved to have had lunch with you gentlemen, and we're sitting in a studio, you know, dressed up in, in our in our Sunday best, talking to the masses in a, in a curated um, portrait of, and that's what we talk about in the book. That's the invention of communication, but the reality is this is communication. Kurt and mm -hmm. I have become really great friends. Damon, we're on our way to becoming great friends just because you're able to reach out on the digital platform and say, hey, you know, I, I like what you're doing and, and I'm interested in this and, and let's talk. And that really gives them a global community that they're a part of in a way that I wouldn't have believed possible 20 years ago. I had a half a dozen friends in other countries. Um, my son, my sons and, and daughter, uh, my son and daughters have networks that extend beyond the boundaries of the United States. And they're not, you know, my, in my son's case, he's 24. Uh, my girls aren't even out of college yet. And, you know, um, they're exposed and have opportunities in places that, again, just kind of boggles the mind. Last but not least is about rigidity. And I think this is really important. Um, they're told, and I was former dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Fairfield and at University of St. Thomas. You know, we go in and say, 40 years ago, if you came out of university, it was very likely that you'd be working in the same job for 20, 30 years. Maybe you would do some type of career change late, late game, but you know, you kind of retire from that. And now you have to rethink what career paths are because they're such rapid. And so for them, this idea that to be rigid in terms of what you study, they're very open to um, kind of looking at a more a buffet uh, idea of education, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of the other thing. For me, I was like, you know, I'm going to make a deep dive in history because I want to be a historian. Um, and, you know, uh, there's a great book called Humility is the New Smart. And it does a good job of talking about this. But in the book, the authors say, at one point when we define smart in this country, it meant I'm smarter than you because I can come up with that answer faster than you can. We were kind of the computers. Today, our phones are the great equalizers. So the yes. reality is anybody can out history me at any time right. on Google. And so I can't compete. What will ultimately make me competitive is humility my ability to engage with others, my ability to explain things in a way, you know, it's what Joseph Owen talks about in Robot Proof in ways that computers can't, is to out-human machines. And that's a different value proposition for us in our contemporary moment. And I find that very exciting for manufacturers in particular because it's going back to something that I shared about Jackie. A life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. Technology, the things that we produce are tools to enhance our lives. Mm -hmm. It's those who are thinking about how to make these more human that I think are going to define and be very um, successful um, in the next generation. 
Okay. So the, <laughs> lots of great comments us. here. I, I know another moment of silence here. Dr. Williams, let's go here. Okay. So the past oh, over. So first off, I, there's a few things that I have to, I can't let go, you, you know, humility, you know, we're in yeah. a day and age where yes, we grew, I grew up in the seventies and watch a lot of TV. Unfortunately you watch TV, you know, yeah. I can watch a, a channel, a show on the a history channel, reach out to a man who I look up to admire, just yeah. respect to no other. And we'll circle back and say, Hey, thanks for the comment. And then I can say, Hey, would you, uh, how about a little interview with me and my, with myself and my friend and you graciously accepted that. So let's go here. You're dealing with a lot of young folks in manufacturers, uh, manufacturing since COVID supply chain issues, unfortunately, labor shortage, workforce development, all sorts of different challenges have gone on. Our country had a terrible distrust, uh, unrest two years ago with George Floyd, you were right in the heart. You were right in Minneapolis uh, with that happening. What are things that manufacturers can do to be better, stronger, to uh, in, entice and embrace millennials, diversity, different race, different color, different creed, different religion, different walks of life with our wonderful melting pot here in the United States, which makes us such a, a it creates such a dynamic competitive advantage for us as an economic powerhouse, what advice do you have for manufacturers to really take diversity to the next level? Uh, great question, Kurt. I, I, first and foremost, um, approach this from an asset, not a deficit model, because a lot of times we talk about, and I, I hear, I, I work with a lot of corporate leaders and the conversation sometimes among us is uh, among them, which is shared with me is, I, I just can't get people to come back to work and they, they're making all these big asks and they expect so much from the workplace now. We have to reimagine the workplace. The reality yes. is that's not going to change. Imagine. We used to joke in the 1970s, I know it was late 70s, um, how are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen New York City? We've determined that we can do this from home. We've determined that people can be productive um, in spaces that aren't um, sterile office buildings, mm -hmm. that you know people don't have to you know, you know, sit in... Uh, a particular place in order to get work done. And we have to embrace that and embrace it in a way that um, redefines the values of the corporation to encompass that part of the identity. That's what's going to make uh, manufacturers in certain areas more attractive to this. Remember the way that we all talked about the, the uh, campus of, of Apple. Computer. Everybody wanted to work at Apple because it was unique. The, what the, and then we heard about what was happening at Google and at Facebook mm -hmm. and other places. Yeah. Corporations, um, manufacturers, big and small, have to rethink the work environment in order to create that same level of excitement. We should be excited about that because it's the democratization of something that wouldn't have been available to us when we were only talking about that existing for tech companies. Mm -hmm. And now it's, you mm -hmm. know, talk about any number of industries that can kind of reinvent themselves and reimagine themselves mm -hmm. in that space. Um, secondly, I think uh, you mentioned, you know, diversity as an asset. Um, we, this was a big conversation here in the Twin Cities, and a lot of people think that I'm at the, in the West Indies, University of St. Thomas. I wish. I'm in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, a little different weather, right? Yeah. I mean, I grew up in Connecticut, gentlemen, and I thought I'm a hearty. Yeah. A <laughs> little different in Minneapolis. So, Just a I, I was Han Solo for a couple of months there. Um, yeah. So, you know, it was, it was really, it's been really important for me to try to help some of our corporate partners understand that social justice issues now are deeply embedded in the fabric of the way that young people are thinking about where they'd like to work, where they'd like to live. They're making decisions based on um, you know, issues that probably wouldn't have impacted us uh, or we wouldn't have thought about or would have been incidental. I, I got to live here anyway, you know, or I have to work here anyway. I need to, and they're taking their time to say from an ethical standpoint, you know, it would be it would be the equivalent of what was happening in the 1980s in terms of the divest in South Africa movement, hmm. where you have people saying, you know, we don't want to do business with this entity, so on and so forth. Well, now it's on another level, and so companies have to rethink a uh, value system and a profile that welcomes that in a way that is not disruptive to the core industry of the company itself, but certainly signals to its employees that it's open to understanding that it's part of a much larger community. And that it has a commitment to that community in ways that builds value. I'll give you a great example. Um, I worked with a, a solid waste management company, and they said, "Look, we are devastated by what happened to George Floyd, but we don't see any way 
that we can be part of this conversation other than diversifying our workforce, which we recognize is a challenge. And so I said, look, I just want to be clear with you here. Solid waste management and pest control are civil rights issues. If you go into communities of color, in fact, if you go back to the 1950s and 1960s, one of the cornerstone issues for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in Washington, D.C. in the late 1960s, which was also a cornerstone issue for the Congress of Racial Equality in New York in the early 1960s, 64, 65, covered by Brian Purnell in his book, Civil Rights in the County of Kings, is pest control. Uh, literally, you have an opportunity now to kind of say, we recognize that when we talk about disparities in this country, it's death by a thousand cuts. We're gonna be true to who we are and what we do by saying instead of investing a bunch of money in education where we have um, no long-term or sustainable interest, we're gonna think about how we can utilize those areas where we do have long-term and sustainable interest to try to make a difference in those communities. And in the process, be attractive to diverse peoples who are looking at that and going, I could work here, I could do that. That seems, you know, uh, that, that feels to me authentic. And again, it also creates a pathway. I had a, a CEO share with me, and this was, you know, a w beautiful human being. So this is not a critique in any way on this individual. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, Dr. Williams, I invested $5 million in the school system and the test scores didn't go up. And I said, you know, part of the challenge there is the model. You're assuming that the investment in test scores is the only challenge or in the schools, the only challenge mm -hmm. that these people face. Long before they get to school, you're talking about the social determinants of health. You're talking about food deserts. You're talking about lack of access to potable water. Um, you're talking about uh, lack of green space. I mean, there are, you know, um, health disparities. So there are a million things that young people are dealing with. Pick something that is genuine to who you are and your identity as a corporation and invest there. This way, it's not going to feel like a deviation. And you're also able to make the case. And, and you can't be afraid of this. Uh, when people come back and say, well, that seems like you're kind of doing something in your own self-interest. Why not? Because that's sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, five years from now, this always happens. We always have these moments. Uh, Rothman talked about it in a book from 1971 called the, the, uh, On the Asylum. And he said, you know, every generation discovers prisons, is shocked by what it discovers and determines in that moment that it will do all it can to reform this evil, vile and brutal system only to lose interest, to wane, to have the next generation come along and go, how come no one's ever done anything about this? <laughs> we go through this whole cycle over and over again. That's awesome. But if you invest in those areas where you've got that longitudinal, sustainable engagement, we can actually, I think, tackle this and tackle it in a way that, again, uses disruptive innovation by rethinking even a way that we're tackling disparity and not thinking solely within terms of those big buckets, which were a little harder to crack because they're big buckets yeah. for a reason. Yeah. Well, I want to say this. <laughs> Your students are so lucky. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, to listen to you, I could listen to you. Oh, I my don't, goodness. Maybe, I don't see how your family feels, but, man, I could listen to you all day. I know we have a hard stop. I know you're a busy yeah. man. First off, God bless you. Thank yes. you. Thank you. And uh, we, I have one last question for you today. Sure. There's a gentleman I saw, uh, my family and I, we saw speak several years ago. His name is David Anderson. He is uh, the author of a book called Gracism. Are you familiar with the, the, this I, uh, book? I am familiar with the book, not with the, I don't know the author. And this man, and, and and when he got, I was so captivated. I went up, he's a big, burly man. I like, I couldn't help my, I like, I gave him a hug. <laughs> David, this is pre-COVID. My wife and daughter were there. I have a picture with my daughter standing next to Mr. Anderson. He is a giant. I mean, he could, pay, you know, pay, pay for the Chicago Bears. And my daughter standing there, he had wingtip shoes on, on his shoe, dressed to the nines, and his shoes say gracism. And what he loves is taking the word racism out of the English, English language and spinning it with grace. My question to you is, what do we need to do as individuals to put this in the past? To And I'm probably being completely unrealistic, but I'm going to go there anyway. Yep. This is a bold question. I'm going to do it anyway. How can we eliminate racism? How could we just walk with racism, Dr. Williams? What do we need to do as individuals? And just, and again, our country, you know, hey, we can bicker, we can make fun of each other, where you're from, what you look like, so on and so forth. But how can we do it in a good natured way? And how can we eliminate the, these challenges that we face in your humble opinion? So I'm going to go back to 1986 um, with you. And I want to talk about the speech that Reagan gave that, that afternoon. Because one of the interesting things is Peggy Noonan is a speechwriter, and Reagan says to Peggy Noonan, the thing that concerns me most, and anyone who lived through that moment, I think there are a lot of us on this call today, remember, they had suspended schools. 
yeah. uh, classes that afternoon so we could watch. So I was in the cafeteria with, you know, freshman year in high school mm -hmm. when we watched the challenger come down. Yep. And I don't think I paid attention the rest of the day. That was so destabilizing to me. Mm -hmm. And Reagan says to Peggy Noonan, school children were watching. So we got to address this. So in the speech, most of the time when people think about Reagan's speech that, that evening, they think about the line where he says, you know, the astronauts have slipped the surly, uh, you know, slipped the uh, bonds of earth to touch the face of God, the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. And it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Not the part that I think we should focus on when we talk about racism. Reagan says earlier in the speech, school children were watching. And he says, the Challenger crew were pioneers and they were leading us into the future. And sometimes painful things happen and the worst thing we can do is not address them. In fact, Reagan goes on to say in this kind of you know wonderful flourish that you know I'm sure Peggy Noonan helped um, craft for him because um, he was the great communicator. But even the great communicator needs a great speechwriter, and Peggy Noonan was that, um, and is that, and so it continues to be um, uh, continues to be that um, great with words. He says, "We don't run from our history; we do things up front in public." That's the way that freedom is, and we wouldn't have it any other way. I would say the same thing with regard to our history. We can't run from it. We have to face it. We have to embrace it. Our moments of triumph aren't moments of triumph unless we understand that history. 1986 for me, when, when people go, I don't, you know, I, I love that you're talking about Challenger, but I don't quite get it. 1986, you have, despite 40 years earlier, uh, Jap keep moving and the Japanese internment and, you know, the two, three, uh, Supreme Court cases related to that. You've got a Japanese American who grows up in Hawaii, who credits the Hawaii public schools for getting him interested in STEM, sitting on the Challenger crew. Um, despite the Holocaust and all the challenges with anti-Semitism in our country, you've got a, a woman of Jewish ancestry who's on that, you know, Judith Resnick, who's on that crew. Ronna McNair, the descendant of slaves, the descendant of sharecroppers, on that crew. And I, I will always say this about the Reagan administration, which is great, for all the people vying in that moment, we think about SpaceX and everything that's happening now, the Reagan administration chose a teacher to go up. You can't be any more democratic than that. I remember being jealous because I was in high school and she was going to teach a lesson and beam it back to earth for all the you know kid, middle school kids, which I thought was amazing. Mm -hmm. I say that because when we run from our history, and in fact, um, Isabel Wilkerson talks about this in her new book, Cast. First thing you do when you go, and I've had two, two surgical procedures this year, uh, last year and this year, one that didn't go very well, one that went very well. Uh, she says, look, the first thing that a good physician does is takes a patient history. And if a, if a physician doesn't ask you the patient history, you know you're in trouble because what they're trying to do is get a portrait of you as an individual so they can help treat you because they under. And if you have a triumph, they can look back at that history and say, these are the things that we've alleviated and, and tweaked and so on and so forth. Um, with regard to racism, you see a lot of pushback now in terms of people saying, well, we don't want to teach that and we don't want to make people feel bad. And we, we have to do that because that's the only way that we can grow. It's almost the, it goes back to Hamilton's advice. You know, we have to fail big, but failing means looking at the warts. Um, Pierre DuPont, whom I love, you know, is, is uh, 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 I love his story. I mean, mm -hmm. think about his father dying in an explosion in New Jersey in 1884. He's 14 years old. At that point, I would have walked away from that industry. And yet yep. Pierre Dupont doubles down and says, this is the family business and we'll forge ahead. Um, and later, as the DuPonts are castigated as the merchants of death, um, a few years later, they're being asked to, to uh, uh, supply the arsenal of democracy. Right. It's kind of the ebb and flow of, and, and we have to look at all that history. All of those moments matter. They weave this beautiful tapestry of who we are and all of our imperfection. That's what makes us great that we can look at those things, we can look at the warts, and we can talk about growth. And when we look at it in that way, um, there's a great uh, essay by Stephen King called Why We Crave Horror Films, my favorite essay of all time. And Stephen King says, for a horror film to work, it has to work on different levels. So, you know, when you're nine, what scares the hell out of you about the Amityville Horror House is that there's a demon in the closet and your parents don't believe you when you say, I can't go to bed because there's a demon in the closet. And so at 10 o'clock when they put you to bed, here's the demon sitting in the closet and mom and dad are at the door and the demon's going, ha ha, they don't believe you. In a few minutes, it's just you and me. Right. But Stephen King says that what got him is he remembers sitting in the theater at the Amityville Horror, uh, horror Movie and there were uh, young couples sitting in front of him. And as the green thing stuff started to ooze out of the walls, the wife turned to the husband and said, oh my God, Bill's. The horror for that couple 
as no, you just bought sunk your life savings into this home that you got for a song. And now the toilet's backed up, there's green stuff coming out of the wall and your kid won't go to sleep. That's a whole nother level of horror. Right. Right. For our democracy to work, for us to feel comfortable and confident in our continuing evolution, the perfecting of the aspirational language that we find in the preamble, uh, because you're not going to find core democratic values in Article 1, Section 8. You find them in the preamble. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union. So we find that in imperfection. We find that in looking at those things that we want to avert our gaze from, but ultimately point the way to how we, moving forward, move closer to that perfect union. I think that's really empowering, really powerful for us. American triumph. And Ronald Henderson says, congratulations yeah. on making this possible. So I'm going to, I'm going to borrow a very famous line and I'm, and I probably have no business even saying this. I have a dream. I had a dream of sp spending this time with you today, Dr. Williams. I have a dream that our country is just going to be so amazing and put some of these negative things just so far in the past. We can celebrate Jackie Robinson. We can celebrate all these wonderful victories and, and celebrate, as you just said, I'm going to steal your line, our imperfections. Yep. So with that being said, I know we're, oh my God, we are at time, Damon. Yep. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. We praise you. We applaud you. I'm giving, uh, how about everybody out there out of your chairs, please give Dr. Williams a standing resounding ovation. So thank you. Thank you. Damon Curry, I really enjoyed my time with you today. I hope that we get to connect again. And thanks for, I have gotten so many great people, including Gail and some others who've connected with me on LinkedIn. So thank you for that. This has been wonderful. I'll tell you, we are so blessed with a great, with just our this network of friends. Yeah, I can't tell you how amazing they are. They come here on Fridays. They hang out with two yeah. goofy guys. Yeah. And we're just very passionate about what we do. And Damon, I don't know what we did in a previous life, but we must have done something really good because it wasn't this life that no. deserved this conversation. <laughs> yeah. So, Dr. Yeah. Williams, I, 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 I've seen it over and over. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you. You are a blessing. You are a gift. Put, you know, do do all of us a favor. Don't take your foot off the pedal. You yep. are doing an amazing job. Guys, down. please buy his book. It's coming out in September. You can buy it now on Amazon. Check out his TED Talk. Tech, uh, connect with uh, Dr. Uh, Williams on, on LinkedIn. All sorts of wonderful, crazy, great things. Keep being a champion for our country. Yeah. Rights and one of these days we're going to get it right. I promise. That's my dream. How's that? So, Damon, take it away, my friend. All right. Well, if I can, they, <laughs> because I, I just honestly, I'm sitting here tearing up the whole time. It's, it's so, it's awesome. It's, a, this was yeah. just, a, this was a beautiful, wonderful conversation. And, yeah. and Dr. William, any parting thoughts, any, anything that you want to share with our, with us as we part? Same advice that you gave to me is keep this up. I, I think we, yeah. we don't do enough talking and, and being together in community. And this just feels good. Yeah. It's great. Thanks We're so much. So much stronger together. Yeah. Yeah, Just we think are. what our manufacturers yeah. could do when we bring in all of our talent, when we bring in our Jackie yeah. Robinsons, when we bring in yeah. our school teachers, our folks that have survived the Holocaust. Yeah. Just think how we yeah. know. We're the only melting pot. I'm sorry, I'm going on a little rant, Damon, but just no. how strong and just, you know, the rest of the world was laughing at us a couple of years ago with all this unrest and hey, that's great. Yeah. Now there's unrest going on, you know, and it's tragic what's going on in other places of the world right now. But as we focus on what's going on here in the United States, boy, if we could just keep pulling together, it is yeah. such a dynamic solution. And we are just, you know, best country on the planet when we just get our heads straight and just love yeah. each other just yep. love each other that's gracism we can make fun of each other just yep. gracism damon yeah. take it away let's wrap up well thanks so much everyone for being here thanks dr williams just a pleasure and a blessing for us to be able to talk with you today and you to be able to share just a fraction of your knowledge with our, us and our listeners thanks everyone for being here have an awesome weekend we're moving into spring enjoy the day get out and have some fun we'll be back again here next week Thanks so much. Dr. Williams, stick with